But one of the days, Thursday, March 31st, 2022, and this is the week in charts. So what are we talk about? Well, before I say that, I want to thank everybody, obviously, for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your business schedule to be here. All right, so what are we talking about? There we go. Current market conditions, obviously, I'll have a lot to say about that and some concerns, too. Your questions on trading, obviously. Your favorite stock and crypto picks, hold off until we get to the live charts, if you don't mind, and put a dollar sign in front of the crypto. So what are we talking about? What are we going to focus on this week? Well, charts and trades under chart show. What a concept. I want to continue talking about how crypto's rising from the dead, or at least was, and a few pairs are really blasted higher, and luckily I've caught at least one of those, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. I want to reiterate what I talked about in yesterday's show for StockCharts.com TV with ogres and discretion, and then I have a little random, some random thoughts on systems, and at last minute, I included a slide about the VIX, and I want to talk a little bit about that. But some, we'll follow up on that in a lot more detail next uh, chart show. And that'll make sense. That was a disclaimer screen. It went flying by. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I hope to sum it up, all the predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's take a look at using a little discretion on a trade. This was CENX. It pulled back. This was in the trading service. It triggered here on a bit of a gap. And then it rallied up and it came really, really close to the IPT, right around 30. And it was just shy of that. And it got there pretty quickly. And by the way, if you're looking to take partial profits a little bit early, one thing to look for is if it gets there or near there, near the initial profit target really quick, like within several days, then by all means, take partial profits because if that happens over a very short period of time, it means that that market has become overbought really quickly. If it takes its own sweet time getting there, then it's like, well, let's let it get a little bit close before we take partial profits. But if it just runs straight up, like this one sort of did, then you gotta be ready to take profits quickly and a little earlier than waiting for the initial profit target. So it was a near miss, and then unfortunately came back in. It's bounced a little bit today, but as you know, so far it's come back in. It happens. Spell with a silent SH. I don't know why I'm doing that. Probably demonetize in a few minutes anyway, especially we'll get the shit coins. <laughs> anyway, I did not take these partial profits because everything was looking great. It was rallying up, and I'm like, okay, this one's doing good. Let me go off and chase some rabbits. And I forgot to take partial profits. And I think part of me was thinking, oh, it might just blast through and keep on going. I'll trail a stop edge today, squeeze out some more money and look like a genius. And then I realized that I should have taken partial profits. <laughs> All right. I've been talking a little bit about profit centers on and off for the last couple of years. And I borrowed the term from Linda Rasky. And basically what I'm doing is it's it's an ancillary way to make a little extra money trading outside of the core methodology. And I often question whether or not it's worth it. I think with the opening gap reversals, it's definitely worth it with some of the other stuff that I'm doing. I don't know. Uh, it, there's definitely a trade-off. I guess that's why they call it trading with that because it does take its toll and it is a lot of work. And it does take a lot of time. When it works, it can be fantastic. And, and what I'm referring to mostly is like the intraday stuff I do with ETFs. And sometimes you absolutely print money doing that when the volatility goes crazy and the market goes in one direction, when you have these route days or these holy grail days we've talked so much about. But in the meantime, you get chewed up a lot. So if I can figure out a way how not to get chewed up a, a lot, <laughs> you might never see my fat ass again. But anyway, let's get back to the opening gap reversals. Right before we went live, I was thinking years ago when I read about Jimmy Rogers saying he just waits until his money lying in the corner and all he does is walk over there and pick it up. And opening gap reversals was the first thing that comes to my mind. And as I traded it more and more, I soon realized it's not quite always that easy. I guess my representative sample early on wasn't big enough but there are some things you can look for, and I'm going to reiterate, the, reiterate those again this week. And 
I don't know if I talked about them last week. I don't know if we had, I think we might have had one example last week. But anyway, I'm going to bore you and go through those one more time. Because here's the thing, no matter how many times I discuss over the gap reversals, I probably get more questions on that than anything else. And by the way, if you're watching this on YouTube and you're not a gold member, then, then why not? <laughs> But I just want to tell you that I do have a lot of information on the back end of the website under the Q&A because I've, I received so many questions on ogres. And not to digress too far, but over the years after answering, and I forgot what the number was, it's something ridiculous, like probably 100,000 emails. And I, I'll probably need to have, I had one surgery in my elbow so far. I probably need surgery in both wrists, maybe another on this elbow, maybe one on this elbow. It's like I need to back off on all this typing and stuff. <laughs> But um, from answering all those emails, that's, that's probably what contributed to that in a big way. And at one point, I came to the realization that I need to reach more people instead of one-on-one. -on -one, and that's why I came up with all these courses and everything and put them on the back end of the website. And then became then came that morphed into the membership area, which morphed into or includes the Facebook group. And a lot of the questions get answered, and I want to thank you guys for answering a lot of those questions and helping me out there. And, you know, in case you get hit by a beer truck, everything's already out there. So this was stock was in a really good uptrend. I did a pre-scan every morning, and I just use I use SpinViz for that to show me the opening gap reversals. And I saw this one was going to gap lower on the open. And I noticed that the average volume was something ridiculous, like 10 million or something. So I said, okay. It's likely to have a lot of institutional sponsorship. A lot of people probably going to be knocked out, okay? And might be wanting to get back in. Some shorts are probably piling on. And all those other things that make for a great ogre. And I'll go through those in just one second. So I knew it was going to gap lower. And it did. And it, in this particular case, as I explained yesterday, I had a really bad open with a lot of stocks on the 29th and, and kind of the, the shit was hitting the fan, so to speak. And I did want to make sure I got a little piece of this one, but I wasn't ready to fully commit to a brand new position. And that, that kind of dovetails in or backs into your trading decisions based on what else is going on that might not have anything to do with the market. I didn't want to pile in this thing with a huge share size. Now this account is not a big account that I, I did to trade in. So hundred shares is probably plenty in this one account, but I did want to do it across multiple accounts and, and bigger accounts, but there just wasn't enough time with, with everything kind of, you know, with the SHTF. So only that with a hundred shares total on this one, I, did, I wasn't able to do it in other accounts. As it began to follow through from that tail low on that first bar, I bought, and then I decided to put a $2 trailing stop in, and I went and bought my life and got busy dealing with the other things I actually was doing. I think that's the day CENX got creamed, if memory serves. Not that I recommend doing this if it's not an opening gap reversal, like I think CENX just dropped like a stone. I did play a bounce in CENX, did an add-on trade and flipped them out to kind of mitigate the damages a little bit. And if you guys want to talk about that next week, I can dig out the trade. CENX, by the way, is in a trading service. And it's still open, by the way. Um, cash in your kids' college funds and put all the money into that stock is what I'd recommend. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. So when I got back to the stock, I saw I was doing okay, so I kept busy doing my other stuff. I knew I had a trailing stop in place. And I decided, it's like, okay, you know what? I've got my two points that I wanted out of this thing. Let me see if I could trail a stop higher. I ended up getting out right here, and that was based on a trailing stop. So I had a trailing stop in place to begin with, and I put a trailing stop in for 50 shares to try to ride that thing even higher because I wanted to take profits on those 50 shares. The thinking is if I could get, let's say, in a case of this stock, about two points was about right, I guess in hindsight because it did go up even more by the end of the day, maybe – it would have been a little bit more, maybe three points would have been a little bit better for a trailing stop. But anyway, my thinking is I want to get a piece off the table, put some money in my account, have that stop at break even, and then trail higher for hopefully the remainder of the day 
and I end up pleasantly surprised. Now, not often, but every now and then, doing that type of money management, same thing we do with the swing trade turning into the core trade, the core trend trades, okay, with the core methodology, I should say. The idea is to ride out that longer term trend. Well, the longer term trend in an intraday trade would just be all day long. And not often, but every now and then, I might catch a 10 point run in something and that'd make, that makes it all worthwhile. Anyway, I did stop out of this right here and the math on everything, it wasn't phenomenal. And again, normally I would do this in more than one account, but I think the point I'm trying to make here is these things can work, they can work nicely and I, and it's hard for me, I'm trying to explain why I just did this little amount other than I guess what I already said, but, but I was so busy, I, I felt like I had to do it just to kind of get the reps in on, on doing it right, if that makes any sense. Like, okay, I'm gonna take this trade, take 100 shares, get the reps on, reps in. So at least I'm doing that sort of automatically, I don't wanna say mechanically, but sort of automatically, and hopefully it makes sense. In this case, it's like, okay, well, I got almost three points out of this. So I felt pretty good about that. The only thing I didn't feel great about, obviously, was I didn't get some size on, but at least I I got a rep in on doing the right thing, okay? And then, you know, maybe down the road, I could put it a procedure to where I'll be able to take these things when the market's in a fast market. But only 50 shares with 2.88 points, that's 144 bucks. And then stopped out a remainder, only made 1.82. 1.82 points, I should say. So that's $91. So didn't set the world on fire, but just by being a little disciplined here and following an ogre plan, I was able to pull 235 in a slightly smaller account. So, you know, here's some fuzzy math, which, you know, my wife makes fun of me because she's like, what's that thing you do? Annualization. She's like, yeah, if you made 235 extra every day, that'd be an extra 59K. So it's better than a poke in the eye. Any questions on the opening gap reversals before I get into picking the best ones? So you want, in some cases, you want to do just the opposite of what we're doing with the core methodology. Now with the core methodology, every now and then we'll, every now and then we'll trade a really, really thick stock, something like the CPE coming off low levels, a, a big, big cap energy stock that's poised to make an inefficient move. By the way, study inefficiency, learn inefficiency. I'm gonna kind of beat the dead horse on that a little bit tonight and then especially in upcoming presentations. But that's where the real money is, is capturing longer term trends in inefficient markets, markets that aren't priced for their their level of priced, I don't wanna say price of perfection because that's a different thing, but aren't priced like at a, a um, where they should be priced, so to speak based on, I hate to say the word fundamentals or something like that, but it's just the opposite with the, the ogre trades. You want a lot of players in the market, okay? You want some institutional interest and in a stock like that, what was that stock? I've already forgot the ticker on it. I'll move on so quickly <laughs> with trades, MOS, I think. You have a stock that's in a really strong uptrend and somebody's looking at the stock at an uptrend and they're getting ready to get their quarterly report in from their mutual fund or money manager, or whoever. And they're they they're looking to see, hey, does this guy have this stock? Because any idiot knows that stock's going up. So they might look to get in on that that liquidity event where it drops like that. Although 11 million shares is plenty of liquidity in that, but it, it creates even more liquidity. And institutions might come in and swoop that up to beat the VWAP or to get it at a bargain or whatever the case may be. Now, some individual traders may go in and think it's a bargain. They might also be knocked out of it and it starts going straight back up and they might have to jump back in. You might have some eager shorts that had already shorted at high levels and they're looking to cover or even better, some new shorts are pissed off because they missed the gap lower and they want to dog pile in thinking it's going to just implode that they were right but early or whatever the case may be and then as it begins to rally they get squeezed out and then it begins to exacerbate the move higher now ideally you want something that's in a strong uptrend 
and set up just like that stock it's in an uptrend it's pulling back or you get a nice tko and i was explaining to somebody earlier tonight every now and then in the service especially if we have big fat stocks in there big thick stocks in there that are trending really really well but they've sold off really hard have a deep pullback i'll tell everybody to wake up and say okay guys tomorrow in the open watch these stocks because you might get a gap lower and then they might be worth trading on that return back higher and in some cases, you can get a, a head start on a longer term position, swing trade to possibly intermediate term trade or longer. Linda Rasky, as I've said a thousand times, uh, Trading Sardines, I don't think I have it within reach anymore. Good book. Uh, I helped her edit it. And um, so I read it in a lot of detail and I actually listened to it through like um, Word, you know, reading it to me. And I was able to pick up a lot of it's weird when you write something and you think and you read it, it makes sense. But sometimes when you listen to it, it doesn't make as much sense. But anyway, she had a person in her office, a new guy, and he wanted to spend time with Linda and learn how to trade and all. He was trading his own account. But a lot of times he would just buy these these burning dogs. These, uh, I think it was S&P futures when they were just at low, low levels. He was trying to catch the bottom. And I think as a general statement, that's a bad idea. All right, any questions on ogres or anything? I know everybody here is is pretty much up to speed on them. Yeah, probably trade more than I do. <laughs> Leave a comment below if you have any questions. If you're not on Facebook, of course. And now it's time for the fine art of buying things that go up and occasionally selling things that go down. So this is a crypto pair. Here's the orders down here. I didn't put my size because my crypto trading is is a very small portion of what I do. And I find it very tempting. I want to do this. I want to just throw more and more money at it. But I also want to see if I can parlay a small account into a huge account and see how that goes. And a couple of times I've done that, but then you know drawdowns are abysmal or can be abysmal sometimes in crypto. But anyway, sometimes you can buy markets that just go up. And not to get not to digress too far, but I, I just barely started a new book on trading neurology. I know you want to party with me. And the reason I just barely started it is I've been reading a book that's about this thick called Shanaram. It's freaking excellent. And it's kind of a long story, but a neighbor recommended it to me. And it's taken me forever to get through it, but it's a great book. I wish I had more time to read it. I never read for pleasure. And that's the first time I've read for pleasure in a long time. And it's really fantastic. But anyway, before I digress too far. One of my hangups with these trading neurology books and trading psychology and behavioral finance, behavioral, um, what's the element they call it? behavioral science books as they relate to markets, is that they sometimes say things like they're a fact, and then they go on to say, well, your brain doesn't work, even though that this is a fact. And, and my hangup is like the one I'm reading now. I think it's a uh, neurology investor neurology or something. I know you want to party with me. I'll get the name. If it's worthwhile, once I get into it more heavily, I'll let you know. But one of my hangups is occasionally they'll talk about something in the market like it's a truth. And there's not a whole lot of truth in the markets. But one of the things that I just read earlier today is like uh, everyone knows that you should buy low and sell high. It's like, well, that's really a way to ruin when it comes to the markets because if something is low, it might be low for a reason and go a lot lower. As I said, 10,000 times, NASDAQ looked pretty low in 2000 when it was down 50%, and then it dropped another 55% from there. And and I think it was in 2000 and 2009, I was overseas and someone was speaking and they were speaking a different language. So I didn't fully understand what they were saying. But the gist of it was, whenever market's down 50%, sell puts. It's like, okay, well, that'll work until it don't. I don't think it would have worked too well in NASDAQ in 2000, but I digress. I think you can get into a lot of trouble trying to buy low and sell high. I would rather buy high and sell higher. Speaking of ruin your account, as I said earlier, when I got into this thing, I hope it doesn't ruin my account. Thor chain rune. So I actually bought right there because it was 
a pair that was going up, okay? And I missed this little, I guess you call it like a little bear flag here. But I like the fact that it was making new highs. I thought it looked pretty good. And then I put it at 20% IPT to sell half at 1181, 983, 1181. And I'm still in and I have a stop here a little bit above break even. So playing with the house's money, so to speak, free rolling, as Charlie Kirk once called it when he saw my money management. So we'll see how it shakes out. Now, this one took a little bit of a leap of faith. And you can see my original order was at 80 cents down here when it was headed higher. And I had a really liberal stop in that. It did hit the IPT. It gave me a little scare at first because it, it, it shot higher, then came back in. And luckily, it took off again. So I've got a trailing stop in there. And I'm starting to give it a little bit of run. But if I stop out, I'll still make over 50% on that second low. And so sometimes you can just buy things that are going up, but make sure the market is inefficient at the time or you're trading an inefficient market. This pair was new, or at least it was new to this exchange, and I think it was new in general. And sometimes there's a lot of excitement with these new things, just like, just like there's a lot of excitement with IPOs. It's the promise of the future, not the reality of the future, okay? So this shit coin might turn out to really truly be a turd, right? But for now, it's going up. And I'm gonna to continue to trail that stop higher. And hopefully a year from now, I'll say, remember that rune I bought at 80 cents? Well, it's now eight bucks. We'll see. Now I want to talk a little bit about bleh, I want to talk a little bit about how easy it is to short. You just need the stock to go down in value. That's all, you know. <laughs> After you short it, of course. <laughs> I remember when I first discovered shorting, all the stocks that were buying were, were going down anyway. So I'm like, okay, well, this shorting thing. Let me let me try my hand at that. And boy, I found out quickly, a lot tougher than it looks explain the use of market orders i use them on fast moving entries but people may want to know on the crypto yeah um what i do with the crypto it it, it you see on the internet that um <laughs> is that how old people say it on the internet people say never use a market order in crypto well, I disagree. A lot of the trading I do in crypto and stocks and whatever else that moves, right? Is uh, what what movie was that? What are we shooting at? Anything that moves, you know. Well, what do you trade, Dave? Anything that moves. So in crypto, you got to be careful sometimes with the market order. But if if I can't use a market order, if I shouldn't use a market order, I should say, what I will do is I will look at the depth of the market let me see if i can find an example of that no i won't be able to do it on the fly but what i'll do is look at the look at the depth of the market with something like kucoin for instance if i want to buy it and you know just above the market there's somebody wants to sell me whatever i'm looking for let's say i'm looking for a thousand bucks whatever a thousand bucks in a pair and I could see that somebody's willing to sell me a thousand bucks, and I could see some buying down below for a thousand bucks, two thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, whatever. Then I know there's plenty of liquidity in that market, and I could just place a market order. Market order means give me your best price. And then hopefully, because there's so many people fighting it out with limit orders, okay, around my price on both sides or whatever, that I'll get my shares, whether I'm buying or selling the pair okay so hopefully that that makes sense and sometimes and i think rogers might have said this or somebody else your best trades are your worst fills okay and uh, an example that was in linda's book and i've seen many other examples maybe in market wizards or other other places or whatever her husband Damien was a, a was a few was might still be a futures broker, and uh, somebody came in, some famous trader, and and bought like 400 big contracts or something like that, and he called him right back and says, "Okay, you got your price," and he's like, "Oh, 
So what's the matter? You got your price. He said, eh, that was too easy. Let's uh let's unload him, you know, because somebody was looking to somebody was looking to sell him those futures to get out. They they said, Oh, somebody wants to buy them, fine, take them. Whereas if he had to pay up for them a little bit, it would mean that the other traders didn't want to let go of their shares. Okay. It's kind of long the theory. I don't use the um What's his name? Dick Orms. God bless you, Dick. Uh, he's no longer with us. He's one of the good guys. But uh, I don't use his ease of movement, but it kind of goes along the lines of his ease of movement where people aren't willing to give up a stock, so it, it goes up or whatever the market it might be, futures or whatever. All right, let's take a look at Dell. Dell's in the trading service a little while back. There it is right there. Sell short, entry of 50.25, stop of 56, IPT of 45.50, 5.75 was the risk. Now, this stock made a double top and then began to implode. Nice little gap lower, actually a couple of gaps lower, meaning that people just want a GTFO, right? So I recommended after it had this big rally day here, okay, let's short it below the low. And it looks like the mother of all tops, especially if you back the chart out. We're going to put a stop up here because sometimes, more often than I would like, obviously, we could be wrong. So initially, this thing starts imploding. It triggers. And by the end of the day, we're feeling pretty damn good, okay? And then it starts to meander around and starts to rally. It's like, oh, boy, here we go again. So now you got a pretty big loss on your hand right away. Sells off again, looks looking like it's going to implode. You're starting to feel pretty good about it once again, right? Then what happens? The mother of all rallies. And you're thinking, you know, it's getting pretty damn close to that stop. I better just bail out on this. And one of the things I was thinking about is because I publish a trading service and I actually take the trades that I recommend, I would never never recommend something to you that I personally won't do, okay? The advantage I have is it forces me to follow my system. So it's like, damn, I really need to get out of this Dell because obviously it's not going to crack, but it's like, what's the plan? Well, in for a penny, in for a pound, I've got to wait until it hits that stop before I can personally exit it. Obviously you can do whatever you want, right? And anyway, so you're probably thinking, F this, you exit. And of course, over the next day or so, it begins to implode again. Not that we're going to make money in this position. We're just right back to about break even, but it sure looks like it's in trouble. It rallied just enough to make everybody think everything's okay. And it's not that far, at least after it rallied away from all time highs. And I didn't say it tonight, I say it often though. If you if you pick up on what I'm putting down, I, I'm basically there's an underlying theme of a psychology of what I do with the market's participants. Okay, so market sells off hard, begins a rally, everybody feels pretty good. Market rolls back over, then you get the mother of all moves lower. Unfortunately, that's what could happen in the stock market overall, like in the S&P futures or S&P 500 cash. I don't want to digress too far before we get to the actual markets, but I'm walking with a buddy of mine the other day, we work out right around the corner at a friend's house. And as we're climbing the stairs, he's like, uh, hey, looks like the market's okay now. And boy, it was scary for a while. Like, oh, geez, you know, I gotta be careful what I say because a while back I told him time to get out. And, and he's like, well, my guy's getting more aggressive now that it's dropping. So it's like, kind of damned if I do and damned if I don't. But I think that's a microcosm of what's out there. You know, I'm, I'm very much a man on the street kind of guy. I try to pay attention. And ideally, they don't know what I do <laughs> when they start telling me about the market. And that way, I can really pick up on the man on the street. Anyway, so it implodes. Of course, you exit it. By this point, you're brain dead. And you're thinking, mother, father. <laughs> Why are those coaches, those football coaches on TV, why are they always going mother father on TV? I don't get that. Now, this was kind of the last minute thing I wanted to do and I ran out of time. But if you go back at several presentations, 
in the weekend charts. And you can find those on my website. You can also find them on YouTube slash C slash Dave Landry. Subscribe while you're there and like some videos. And if you don't like them, go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> I'm half kidding. I'm not. But you can find a in the wicked charts, you can find a playlist there. And I did talk about, I think it was a CVR3 modified a couple of weeks ago. And I guess it's got me thinking again. I've I've always dabbled here and there, so to speak, in these in these VIX ETF futures. Never really in a major way, but what I'm thinking about and, and what I'm working with a little bit is looking for that reversion to the mean move and provided you have like an intraday trend okay if you're going to trade the vix realize that it's a reversion to the mean market you wait for it to get stretched one way and look to go the other but what i've done and i have a few more trades i want to show you here maybe in the next coming week or two if time allows what i've been doing is waiting for it to get stretched to where it's it's close to a buy signal for the for the the daily chart for the futures or whatever for the s p futures and then look to possibly catch a pop in that VIX. But it's something I'm a little hesitant to share. It's a little bit more advanced and it's also can be a little bit uh, complicated in that you have to really understand what you're doing. And as I said before, Larry McMillan once pointed out that somebody on, I never throw anybody in the bus because I say a lot of stupid shit myself, but <laughs> but somebody was on C, somebody was on CNBC and they had the VIX futures all wrong. And think about how complex this is, and this is why I'm a little hesitant to get into it, but the VIX is a derivative based on a hypothetical. It's kind of like a derivative based on a hypothetical at the money options. The original one was OEX 100 uh, puts and calls. It's on puts and calls, and it measures the implied volatility of a hypothetical 30 days out don't quote me all on all that i'm not pretending to be a vix expert but it's something i played with played around with here and there anyway so the vix itself is a derivative it derives its value from something else the vix futures is a derivative of a derivative so that's a second derivative and then the etf is a derivative of a derivative of a derivative okay so you see how it gets complicated quick but just know that it tends to revert back to the mean and instead of using it as signals for trading like i discussed a couple of weeks ago and it might not be something you want to follow mechanically by the way in fact any system that i show you i'm not suggesting you follow mechanically but i would look for times when it could work and it could give you a little bit of an edge versus trading mechanically just like the the 230 ema we talked about last week which i'll touch upon now <laughs> so last week i talked about should you bother with a trend following system because they do have a lot of issues to them and these are some of the things that i talked about and one thing after going back and forth with you guys a little bit last week one thing I want to point out is you'll print money if you're in the right place at the right time, but you, you have to obviously recognize when you're in the right place at the right time. And I showed all those fantastic crypto trades and a lot of the, the RS type of trading I did over the last couple of weeks in crypto has been based on that. And on the downside, it worked out really well because crypto was inefficient and it trended lower for a long time. However, there will be times where you'll get chewed up quite a bit with a trend following system, okay? So just want to get that out. You want to make sure the the market itself is inefficient or becoming inefficient, making some inefficient moves, such as energies when they bottom out forever, then they begin to rise from the ashes. The Phoenix strategy is what I call that, which is basically things like bow ties and first thrusts and, and maybe... Now, even the 230 EMA coming off of lows. If you're not familiar with that 230 EMA, once again, I'd refer you back to my YouTube playlist for the week of charts. We talked about it not too long ago, and I also talked about it in the quick clips, which you can find those also 
on YouTube. And then the other thing I talk a lot about is a, a heavy dose of money management. And then make sure, like I talked about last week, you're using the partial, you're taking the partial profits, like I just showed you, getting that stop up to break even, and then trailing that stop higher on the remainder, as opposed to using something like the 30 EMA to stop you out, which longer term, you might end up at that 30 EMA. I've, I've often thought about what would happen if you had a system, and if one of you guys wants a noodle with it, knock yourself out. But it, what would happen if you had a system that started with a with a shorter term moving average, and as you were in it longer and longer, and as it moved more and more in your favor, you began to use longer and longer term moving averages. So that moving average would would pull away from price. Now, moving average, as you know, even if the stock sits still, especially an exponential moving average, it will it will catch up to price and give you a bit of a time stop, which I'm not a huge fan of. I'm not a huge fan of time stops, but I'm wondering if you added time to that moving average, like maybe start with a 10-day moving average, and then as it moves more and more in your favor, you're at a longer and longer term moving average. And the reason I'm saying that is if you look at how my stops look, if you were, I used to painstakingly plot them out for these presentations, but I realized that just not enough time in the day to go in and do every little adjustment. So I just kind of smooth the line out from where they would likely be to where they are now. Like it's here now, and I knew I went up along the way and now it's here. But if you look at that line, it will begin to look, this line here, for instance, like a longer term moving average. So that's what I was thinking about there. So we talked about this last week. And just a 2.30 real quick, it's just two lows greater than the exponential moving average. And I'm just saying this because somebody's gonna leave a comment below, ask me what that is, and just save me the, the, the trouble of answering once again. But do, do poke around my website, do poke around YouTube, do become a gold member if you're not already a gold member, or even better, become a member of the core trading service. And there's nothing secret that I do. Everything is fully revealed as you guys no. The trading by as my as I say each week, my wife told me the trading book, the trading book, the Facebook group was the best thing I've done. Dave Landry's Trend Traders. You do have to be at least a gold member to qualify, and that just keeps the riff raff out. <laughs> all kidding aside, you know, I'm kind of half kidding about that, but all kidding aside, I've been parts of forums in the past, and they all tend to, as I've said quite a bit. They all tend to digress eventually to kind of lord of the flies. <laughs> and I've seen it even in, in professional groups. And years ago, I was part of, a, I don't know if he still has it. I think he marked it into something else. And I think he emailed me a while back. I just never got around to, to joining up again. But I was a member of John Murphy's, John Murphy, dating myself here. Uh, <laughs> John Bollinger's group, he gave me an invitation to be part of his group. He had a group of professional traders that were in a forum together, and he asked me if I'd be part of it. And of course, you know, I, I accepted graciously. But even though those guys were a bunch of names that every one of you would know, <laughs> it, it just seemed like it ended up being Lord of the Flies after a while. All right, crypto, the ones in, and I guess this one needs to be uh, cyan too. The ones in cyan you see here, and if you have any crypto picture when we look at, feel free to type them in now. Just put a dollar sign in front of them so we get the stocks. I can separate them out. This ape did hit the IPT. I do have a stop in place on it. It's another one of those cases where it kind of took off, came back in, and began to take off again, kind of like an IPO deep pullback type of thing. Plus, the relative strength was really strong on that one. Here's a GMT. So far, so good on that. You can see why a trend probably a moron would be long that market. Let's take a look at the Mag Daddy Bitcoin. I'm not sure. Does anyone know if this is a, a real tick here today? But it's kind of interesting. It's like whenever I feel like, like damn, this Bitcoin's going to go up forever. I better hodl some, you know? <laughs> it then begins to correct. It's weird. It's like whenever you think a market's going to go up forever, that's right about the time you should uh, think about lightening up a little bit. I guess like the GMT, I already did. But anyway, Bitcoin's coming back in. So that's kind of interesting. It, it looked like it was taking off. Everybody was getting excited. 
And then of course it's coming back in, which is fine with me. I, I, I do intend over time to hodl a little bit and I know I'm kind of breaking my mantra, but, and, and again, again, you gotta be careful as I say each week, if you start listening to Michael Saylor, you'll end up uh, <laughs> dumping your grandkids' college funds and putting into crypto, right? But I think it was Saylor or someone like him that said, 1% is plenty. And if you put 1% into crypto, specifically bitcoin he's 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 he doesn't believe in the shit coins and it goes to zero you're down one percent okay but if you put one percent in crypto i'm sorry in bitcoin and it goes up a hundred times then you've doubled your entire net worth now there's a lot of ifs in that sentence it's like i went in for lunch you know if you buy gold and it just goes back to where it was you'll make 100 percent of your on your money actually with silver it's like okay like larry williams says it's like they're pumping that silver because it goes straight up but they sure do want your dollars for that silver <laughs> anyway so i don't know I, you know the, the jury's still out i am uh I am a fan of crypto longer term. And I tell you, uh, again, Michael Saylor's got me all pumped up on the the Bitcoin. As I go through a few of these, one thing I'm noticing is obviously they're beginning to pull back a little bit, okay? And we could see some setups in, in some of these. John wants to talk about Badger. So let's take a look at that. Before we do that, there's Ethereum. Ethereum's kind of looking pretty cool in here. Bar one, bar two, entry above this high here would be the 230 EMA, okay? Notice that this would not have been a trigger here and depends on how liberal entries are, you might've gotten caught in a little whipsaw here if you were shorting it, but you'd be long with that system right there and now it's beginning to pull back a little bit, which is fine. I'd like them to just take their own sweet time. So let's take a look at Badger. Okay, that Bitcoin looked better. So it looks like looks like that was a bad tick. But it's getting pretty it's getting hit pretty hard in here. Kind of a TKO move. Usually with TKOs, you know, I like to see a much longer term trend, but that does have a TKO-ish look to it right there. Okay, Badger, let's take a look at that. D -D 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 -R. Yeah, that looks good, John. Let's uh let's back, let's take a look at a couple things here. So it's been a longer term downtrend. It's kind of first thrusty. It's coming off of all time lows. That's always a good thing, right? So yeah, I think that looks pretty good. Absolutely. Depends on how aggressive you want to give it to your entry. But uh I'll put that on my uh list to take a look at. We'll make that one blue. By the way, as I often preach, it might not work right now because the market's just shifted over to a new day. Yeah, I don't have any green right now. So crypto's getting hit overnight. But sometimes what you could do is, as I've said before, sometimes you can just buy the strongest pairs. In other words, just buy stuff that goes up, right? But yeah, ideally, I would prefer something like Badger that's pulled back or something that's set up like a core methodology type of setup. All right, any more crypto before we shift gears and go to the overall market? While we're here, let's do this real quick while we're in the browser. Let's go in and take a look at ACP real quick. And we'll take a look at the TFM 10% system. And there it is. Let's put it, let's put the, let's put cash up, okay? Okay, so, so here's the deal. Like I said last week, we had a sell on a, on a midweek basis way back here, okay? And that's when I got a little bearish and uh, my Cajun just slipped out on oh, Kunas. <laughs> Barsh. <laughs> I'm told don't Google Kunas if you're not in Louisiana because when my search engine comes up with Kunas stuff like guys in P Rogues and what's his name, Troy Landry and stuff like that. 
hunting alligators. We saw a bunch of alligators over the weekend, by the way, for what it's worth. <laughs> I digress again. Little ones, though, they weren't that big. They weren't about that big. Good eating size. Anyway, we are back above the buy line, which means we're within 10% of all-time highs, which means the market, as a general statement, is, is healthy. As a general statement, okay? We did have that sell signal. Sometimes you get a sell signal like back here, then you get a little pop, making you think everything's fine, and then you get the real move lower. That's my big concern with the market. So this is a weekly chart. So we did have a thrust down and then a bit of a pullback. So on a weekly chart, that's a first thrust, sort of, okay? Now, if we close above 44.38, write that down, on Friday, I'm sorry, if the low is above 44.38, then if we have one more week, and I'm a little bit, I think a calendar week would work fine. So then the following Friday, next Friday, not tomorrow, but the Friday coming up, April, whatever, it's ninth maybe. And it closes, the low closes above this 50-week moving average. It's the weekly chart, by the way. Then it would actually be a buy again, and this signal would be a whipsaw, okay? Well, from there to there, you lose about 4%. So what, okay? If this thing were to drop down to lose half of its value, which it occasionally does, okay, even this pandemic slide, it dropped about another 30%, 29 and change, who's counting, right? As you can see, it was down 35% overall. That's a pretty big slide. And as I say each week, I had friends right here, couldn't sleep at night, right here, couldn't sleep at night, right here, couldn't sleep at night. You know, then my phone's really starting to ring right here. I'm like, <laughs> as I said, quite often the bombs are already blown up. Anyway. Next week, we get a low above this moving average. If, if provided we make it through this week, which we might not, then um, we'll see what happens. But we could get a buy signal then. All right, let's shift gears. Let's go, let's take a look at the market real quick. And then if you have any individual stock picks, then um, feel free to ask about them now. And by the way, come to the live shows, register if the link is old. I think the link is really old. Go to davelander.com slash webinar, participate live. Yeah, we've got to get the numbers back up on these shows. All right, S&P 500 got whacked a little today, as you can see. Anybody, my screens are off over there. Anybody know what Future's doing overnight? I think I have, I might have taken home a little bit on the short side. Maybe it'll pay for dinner tonight, pizza, pizza party, right? Okay, we had this big rally up, okay? And it kind of went straight up in here. And the market will often do what it has to do to aggravate the most people or cause the most pain in the most amount of people, to fool the most amount of people. You know, insert your favorite market adage, but it's true. And just like I said, my buddy, he's kind of feeling like it's the all clear. I'm like, uh, I don't know. It might be, I hope it is, I hope I'm wrong. Or I hope the system is wrong. It's not me that's wrong. It's a system that would be wrong in this case. But following the system, it's like, you know, I, I'm a, I've i gotten out of the way, okay, other than whatever individual stocks I'm in. But anyway, nice retrace higher, looking great. And then we had a little bit of a sell-off, obviously, today. A tiny bit yesterday, no big deal. Today's kind of a big deal. And I think selling will beget more selling. Some of this might be some serious short covering, okay? And shorts, when shorts get squeezed out, they get pissed off. They come back in out of vengeance. And I know I've been trying to short this market on an intraday basis based on the overbought nature of it. I'm not fighting the trend, but I'm ready to get on that possible rollover on a daily chart when it looks like the intraday chart is, is cracked. But you gotta be really careful. And I was thinking about this last week when I was doing some of that stuff, the market could take, could, what did Keen say? The market could stay irrational a lot longer than you could stay solvent. I'm sure he sounded a little bit more eloquent when he said it. NASDAQ composite down about a percent and a half. You can see it's kind of stalling in that retrace rally too. So that's a little bit concern. Even if the market gets going, the NASDAQ, the Russell and the peace to a lesser extent, there's some overhead supply. So the Russell, you can see, is going to have all this overhead supply back here to deal with. Keep it on these lows, as I've been saying, a nausea. And we take those out. It could get really, 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 really 
ugly. Now, some of these areas in here, yeah, I did, what does this do? Oh, here we go. Some of these areas in here like durables, you can see got whacked pretty hard today and aren't too far from brand new lows. And they're in downtrends. And if I could, again, try to make this work, I should just plug in a wheel mouse before we show. I can't, I don't have enough USB. Anyway, take my word for it. This is at really high levels. Maybe look at a weekly chart and you can see some of these areas, if they begin to crack for these high levels, it could get pretty ugly pretty quickly. Financial services stalled out a little bit. Looks a little bit like the P's, okay? But not looking too good. Drugs were kind of going straight up. Corrected a little bit today, right at the prior highs. Could, could have a hint of a double top in here. I wouldn't get too excited just yet. I wouldn't get outright bearish on them, but the fact that they're so overbought, if they begin to sell off and then everybody once again runs for the doors, for the door, that's when it could get a little ugly. Biotech actually looks like it's trying to bottom out, but once again, longer term, there it goes. I'd be concerned if it began to crack past those lows because it is a long way to go. So I think it's okay to be cautiously optimistic now, but I think we're a long ways away from the all clear. In fact, that, that would be a good headline. <laughs> A long ways away from the all clear. So take a look at retail. Retail got whacked today in a retrace rally. And this big picture retrace rallies, I just I don't trust them, okay? And you probably think, oh Dave, what about something like a first thrust? Well, first thrust is a market that's coming off of major, major lows, like all-time lows for some of these forex pairs or all-time lows for energies six months ago and stuff like that. Transports have been all over the place. They've kind of gone straight up, but they got whacked in here today. So again, I think a lot of these areas that are going straight up, they start going down, everybody's gonna to have to rethink their position. So my buddy, for instance, he didn't, he got real defensive with me when he said his guy was buying more and I must've rolled my eyes or something. I, I'm not good at <laughs> concealing my, I'm not a really good poker player, you know, unless, of course, if I'm drinking, my emotions are a little bit better, but. Uh, but then my brain's not working. So that's a, another story altogether. But uh, my wife could read me really well. And I must roll my eyes or, you know, laugh or something. <laughs> because he's like, oh, my guy's maybe a lot of money. And, and you know, because he was buying as the market's falling out of bed. And, you know, it's like, that'll work until it don't. And I said, the market has made you a lot of money. I don't think your guy had a lot to do with it. But if the market comes right back, the guy will look like a genius. Well, now the market's coming back. He asked me if I thought the market was okay because he was feeling better about his, his portfolio, which the way he asked me made me realize that well, one of these days, one of my friends is going to actually watch these presentations where I talk about them. <laughs> That'll be a lot of trouble. I'll have less friends. But anyway, I could tell by the way he was talking that, that he actually was concerned. He didn't express that concern earlier because he was defensive. So I know him as a micro, with, with him as a microcosm, there's a lot of other people feeling the same way, like, oh, we dodged a bullet, everything's gonna be okay. And everything might be okay, okay? But as a as someone who's been doing this for a long time, I know that sometimes markets could really fake you out, okay? And do the most harm to the most amount of people. The semiconductors got whacked in here. They've been trying to bottom out lately, but it's a bottom at high levels, as I was talking about, or rather bottom at low levels. They got whacked in here too, and it's a case where they've kind of gone straight up. Everybody feels pretty good. And again, everybody can rush for the door at the same time. That's my big or biggest concern there. So that's pretty much it for the sector action. Let's take a look at bonds real quick. Serious downturn remains intact. So far, just pulling back. Bonds down, what's that mean? Rates up. We'll take a look at the dollar. Dollar's kind of hanging in there, like John pointed out last week. It was a good point. Just because the dollar's hanging in there doesn't mean the dollar still is what it used to be. You know, it's like, uh, what did Yogi Bear once say? Back then, $10 was still $10, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of ridiculous now. My my wife actually complained because I wasn't eating all the food in the refrigerator before it went bad. It's like, well, I I can't keep up with the leftovers lately. And, and I'm, I'm fat enough without eating more food. But yeah, now everybody's starting to look at prices. SES, SES looks looks good, easy for me to say. It's got good volume. 
I prefer a little bit more knockout, John, but I'm going to have to give you a high five on that one. Uh, you know, this is the, the, the die and the fly pattern. Sometimes with IPOs, they come public, they absolutely die, and then they begin to take off again. So I like this one a lot. I actually prefer a deeper pullback, but that looks pretty damn good. Uh, I like it, okay? So I'll give you a high five on that one. Two good picks tonight, Badger and SES. Badger in crypto, SGML. Let's see if you go three for three tonight, John. Yep, I like that one too. It needs a little bit more pullback. You could probably trade it as it is. I prefer a little bit more pullback. Where are we longer term? Yeah, it's still pretty much a, um, it's a toddler. It's, a, it's an IPO. That's a weekly chart. So it hasn't been around that long since last fall. Yeah, again, a little bit, little bit more deeper, but uh, it looks good. Okay, John's SGML is better. Okay, so Craig's got HD as a short. Oops, just fat finger or something. Yeah, that looks good. That's kind of a that was kind of a bigger picture play, huh? I think we were going after lows a while back. You know, that's the short side, okay? Hey, let's get short. Get stopped out, then it implodes, right? <laughs> yeah, um, I think that looks like a stock's in a lot of trouble, but I know you're already short, okay? Yeah, you're short from 317. Yeah, see, now you're in a position of strength, okay? That's good. So just write it down. Thank you, Rasky. Most pain than most people. Okay, I'm short from at 317 points. 317 points at 250. At 250. What do you mean by that? I'm, I'm confused. I think it rallies tomorrow a.m. Tomorrow's close. Thank you, Rasky. Most pain than most people. For further downside, SPY 200 DMA is always key. Price target. Okay, yeah, he's looking to, for 250. Yeah, it's a pretty big uh, price target, but yeah, I'm impressed. That's a that's a big picture short that worked out. Yeah, he's looking for 250 on this one. Short from 317. Yeah, you got about 20 points in it so far. That's for 18 points. That's pretty good. But yeah, that looks like it's uh it looks like it's a cheap dip. Let's uh take a look at this. Yeah, it's got a ways to go. Uh this this back here could be a little bit of support. Okay. Remember, sometimes markets have really, really long memories. If it takes that out, it's going to 140. But yeah, it looks good. All right, any more? TCN. TCN, I'd like, I might still like it. But yeah, it looks good. I don't know where the, um, here we go. Yeah, that looks pretty good, John. You've got okay volume on that, 100,000 average. It's pretty good. Um, if it pulls back any further, then you're kind of coming back to where it broke out from. But you do have a bit of a base, and that is a first pullback. That's a reach, right? Yeah. It's hard for me to get excited about a reach, but it's got it's HV's 30 on it, which is which is okay. Which is not bad. I like to see a little higher HV, but yeah, that one's okay, John, for sure. So uh we'll rank yours. I think we'll I think SES is number one, Badger number two, SGML number three three and then this will be number four all right the john show <laughs> it takes thank you greg for participating too all right any more well as usual i thank everybody for coming i appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule I, I love these shows as you can probably tell i'm humbled that you guys would take time to come and girls and come to the show if we don't talk to you now and then everybody have a great weekend i'll see i think almost everybody here tomorrow and facebook for everybody else and you too i guess may the trend be with you thank you so much